Thanks, Tony. Cheers. Hi, everybody. I'll carry on talking about a uh, little bit something that uh, Jamie started talking about, the uh, rigidity in prosthesis or the compliance in prosthesis and what sort of a uh, difference there is between uh, the, the two aspects and, uh, and what it does to the amputee. Now, let's just uh, generally uh, talk about how prosthesis is being made up. So you've got a prosthetic foot. Um, if it is a, a, a sash foot, as Jamie was saying, you only get compliance due to some compression at the heel. Um, most feet allow sagittal plane motion, um, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and if you've got a prosthesis um, uh, higher than the knee, disartic uh, knee disarticulation, you then also have a prosthetic knee joint that gives you some flexibility. Generally, however, uh, just proximal to the prosthetic foot, you only have a rigid pylon. Uh, as an alternative to that, you could have a motion adapter which allows some transverse rotation and also some longitudinal translation. Longitudinal translation is a little bit like a pogo stick effect. It allows about 10 millimeters of compression. The reason why some amputees do have a motion adapter included in the prosthesis is simply because the transverse rotation aspect, which you can also have to some extent in prosthetic feet, but it's only very, very little that you get. Uh, the transverse rotation aspect is supposed to allow the socket uh, to track the motion in the transverse plane of the residuum. And the longitudinal translation is there to provide some degree of shock absorption. However, very little work has been done to establish what is going on with motion adapters and their effect on gait. That is why we thought we're conducting a little study on this one. We used 10 transtibial amputees and we took a, a couple of measurements. Um, rotation and translation measured on the motion adapter. Uh, the pressures measured at the residuum socket interface. We thought that one would be particularly important because, well, if the motion adapter is about tracking motion of the residuum in the transverse plane. And if it is about the shock absorption, so surely it should have some beneficial effect on the uh, in-socket pressures. And like with uh, uh, most uh, studies, we of course also captured uh, uh, ground reaction forces and joint angles and calculate inverse dynamic and so on. But uh, because of uh, the restriction of time here, we don't have time to go into that. Now, motion at the motion adapter. Uh, we decided to uh, design a little device that helps us to capture that motion rather than using uh, the camera system. We used a, a cam that was a, a plate cam that was mounted around the motion adapter and this works in conjunction with two linear displacement transducers. One mounted parallel to the longitudinal axis of the motion adapter, one perpendicular to it. Here's a little diagram that uh, shows you the action of the motion adapter and the plate cam as seen from above, where the uh, blue crosses in the middle will be the center of the motion adapter. So you would be basically looking into the motion adapter from above. And here you can see the transducer that is mounted perpendicular to the longitudinal axis and, uh, and its plunger that is being depressed due to motion of the cam. Uh, the cam itself was manufactured using a lathe, uh, so therefore you've got a fixed radius. It was an easy way of manufacturing the cam, and uh, that is being represented by the red line. Ideally, however, to have a linear output from uh, the uh, displacement transducer, you should not have a fixed radius, but a, a spirally radius, as indicated by the green line. Uh, there's a sort of slight offset between the green line and the red line, but the, the calculation showed it was a, a very little and uh, it didn't mat matter for the accuracy of the measurements, as uh, was demonstrated in the paper that is referenced at the bottom. Uh, here you can see the motion adapter in action. And you can see how transverse rotation can take place without the plunger for longitudinal translation being affected and vice versa. So basically, we decoupled the two motions and could measure them independently. To take the measurements, we first of all had to uh, relate um, a, a transducer output to uh, motion, and so therefore had to calibrate it. 
We did that using a micrometer. Um, we took measurements every 0.2 of a millimeter over the 10 millimeter plunger movement. We repeated the measurements 10 times. Then, once calibrated, we now wanted to see how do the transducers perform when they're actually being strapped uh, to the motion adapter and, um, and when they uh, are being operated by the cam. So we devised a type of protractor. Um, a little metal banner was uh, stuck in uh, by the pyramid adapter at the top of the motion adapter. And uh, on the left-hand side, on the bottom, on the white whiteboard, you can see um, the... Uh, uh, in a very fuzzy way, the uh, scale for the protractor. And so we can uh, could take a measurement every point two of a degree over the uh, uh, total 36 degrees um, of transverse rotation of the cam. Here we can see the comparison between micrometer calibration, shown on the left-hand side, and protractor calibration, shown on the right-hand side. The top row shows transducer 1, Bottom row shows transducer 2. Um, we fitted a sixth order polynomial to the data, uh, which is represented by the black line. And as you can see, the, the black line on the left for both transducers is very similar to the black line on the right. Uh, again, the details of this one are also captured in the reference that I've uh, given before. So basically, the error that was uh, it, that is inherent within the transducer itself, it was repeated within the cam, meaning that the cam uh, very accurately captured uh, the motion uh, with the help of the transducer. Now, having looked at uh, how to capture motion of the motion adapter, we then looked into how to uh, measure the residuum socket interface pressures. Uh, for that, we used uh, TechScan Flexifor sensors that were uh, directly attached to the residuum, and um, a silicon roll-on sleeve was being pulled over the residuum, and the sleeve had a, a ratchet pin lock distally uh, to suspend the uh, uh, socket with. The landmarks that we have chosen were supposed to be clinically relevant. So the red ones, there are no red ones, the green ones, um, are... Uh, landmarks um, where there are bony prominences and so they are generally being considered as uh, pressure sensitive and the yellow ones are landmarks without bony prominences that are considered pressure tolerant. Um, on this slide on the left hand side you can see one of our participants fully kitted out uh, with the markers and uh, at the bottom you can see some cables trailing up the limb from the transducers and from the flexifor sensors uh, going to a waste belt where a power unit supplied a constant voltage uh, for the transducers and, uh, and a telemetry unit um, wirelessly send the data to a PC. You can see an amputee, uh, one of the participants walking on the top right hand side and for those who are interested um, you can also see on the black diagram the mark arrangement that we had using the cast method as close as us. most of you probably know. So we had four different test conditions to test both types of motion, transverse rotation and longitudinal translation, uh, individually, not at all, and combined. Here are the results regarding motion at the motion adapter. Uh, top diagram shows transverse rotation, bottom diagram longitudinal translation. The red line uh, is the output obtained when uh, both motions were combined. And in both cases, there was uh, greater transverse rotation and greater longitudinal translation when both motions were uh, permitted simultaneously. And uh, uh, transverse rotation was smaller when it was permitted on its own, and so was longitudinal translation. Um, the pattern of transverse rotation was, well, uh, initially during stance, the socket rotated internally, and then during the second half of stance phase, it, it rotated externally, to some uh, degree uh, perhaps um, uh, representing uh, some of the pelvis transverse rotation. The output of, of longitudinal translation was more M-shaped, possibly reflecting the uh, uh, M-shaped vertical ground reaction forces. Here are the results regarding the uh, pressures 
on the left hand side the uh, the green labeled graphs are again those uh, landmarks that are uh, pressure sensitive and on the right we've got the pressure tolerant um, landmarks each diagram has four lines representing the four test conditions and you can see that uh, each graph is also to some extent m-shaped perhaps not so much on the medial tibial flare it's a bit more uh, skewed but generally they are m-shaped possibly again representing uh, m-shaped vertical ground reaction forces uh, the output um, is as you can see by the black line representing no motion at the motion adapter is greatest when none of the two motions were permitted and as shown uh, uh, with the red line uh, the um, for the, the pressures were generally smallest when both motions were permitted. You can also see when you look at the scales, and you, may, you might appreciate that the scales are not the same for all the graphs, simply because I didn't want to make them the same, because otherwise some of the lower outputs would have been, the, the, the lines would have been so close together, you wouldn't be able to distinguish between one line and another. But uh, when, when, you, when you try to look at the scales, the largest output was reached at the fibula head with uh, just over 160 kilopascals, uh, closely followed by tibial tuberosity, another bony landmark, uh, at uh, nearly 130 kilopascals, uh, which is uh, quite small compared to, uh, quite large rather, compared to the um, soft tissue landmarks on the right. Surprisingly, one of the lowest outputs uh, was reached at the distal end of the tibia but that may have been uh, to some extent also due to um, the rectification of the cast uh, before socket manufacture, because as uh, most of you know, the, the uh, cut end of the tibia is quite often very sensitive to pressure. So uh, that is why we may have obtained very low pressures in that area. To a bit, be a bit clearer about what is going on here with, uh, with the pressures and the pressure distributions, we um, put together the weighted average of all the interface pressures. You see um, four pairs of columns. The, uh, the left side of each pair uh, represents the maximum pressure, which is the highest peak on each graph. And the uh, right-hand column of each pair rep represents the total pressure, which means it's the largest area under the graph. The reason why we also calculated the area under the graph is because we thought that may be clinically relevant because uh, it is not just peak pressures that are important, but how long are pressures actually being sustained on the tissues, and uh, because that may be an indication of uh, tissue recovery and uh, the likelihood for uh, for perfusion. Um, each pair of columns represents one of the four test conditions, and um, and as you can see, the um, weighted average is the highest for both peak and uh, total pressure when no motion was uh, permitted and again it is lowest when both motions were permitted. So in a nutshell, uh, if we have got uh, more compliance that means uh, uh, this is due to more, uh, that we have got more motion at the motion adapter and also more compliance means less residuum socket pressures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And can I take some questions from the floor? Yes, please. Hi, uh, how do you calibrate the text cuts, particularly in the concave uh, surfaces? Well. Let's put it up. I didn't like the text scan uh, sensors at all, <laughs> to, to be honest, because they needed, uh, well, uh, for a start, quite a complex um, um, uh, electronic setup, which, which, which I had to uh, put together myself. So, so that was a bit of a nuisance. And um, and they needed a conditioning. I think it was something like you needed to load them up to 10 times with uh, about 80% of the maximum load. We, we thought, well, what's, what's, uh, what's the maximum load? We haven't measured it yet. So I consulted the literature on that one, and uh, that gave us uh, some idea. Um, I did not um, calibrate that for any particular curvature. It was calibrated using uh, using just a flat. We had uh, uh, two discs that were being put together with uh, weights of known masses being put on there, and that was repeated several times. Um, because we, we thought, well, okay, the... the uh, the sensors are being put on a curved 
surface, but uh, the, those radii, they obviously vary within the socket. They have, uh, I think the, the sensing area was only about seven or eight mil in diameter. So the, the curvature itself had very little, um, well, it, the, 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 the radius of the socket itself was very, very large compared to the very small sensing area. And because we used um, a silicon roll-on sleeve, um, that also prevented, well, they can't, they can't prevent, but reduced the likelihood for the sensor itself uh, being bent. But yeah, that is obviously some degree of ambiguity in there. And also, uh, as you know, they, these sensors only measure normal force. It would have been great to look into shear forces, which we did at the time, but we thought, well, just too complex and uh, let's just stick to normal forces. Yep, All right. Thanks, I was just wondering what kind of magnitude of rotation do you see between the residuum and the socket and how does that compare to the motions you see in the prosthetic uh, well, leg itself? We, we couldn't capture that because we couldn't look inside the socket so so we, we, we don't know how much the residuum itself moves. Is there any literature data on that? I'm just wondering you know, how, how big is the magnitude of that compared to what you see in the prosthetic? Is it a lot smaller or do you think it's about in, in terms of transverse rotation, I wouldn't know at all. I, I know that uh, your colleague, uh, 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 I forgot his name again, Buse, yeah, uh, he, did, uh, he did a study on that one where he looked into uh, radiographically capturing motion of the, uh, of the bone inside the socket. But I think that was with regard to flexion extension and but, so on, wasn't it? The bone, the bone has such a yeah, yeah. between the, the different tissue layers. Uh, yeah. There are some articles on pistoning within the socket, but some claims being made that are very difficult to imagine how you would measure uh, yeah, yeah, that, to that degree. Yeah, like absolutely, it, uh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it, but not, not very well stipulated, I think. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, we, we were at the time looking into possibility of uh, perhaps cutting holes in the socket and attaching markers uh, to uh, to some landmarks, but uh, we also thought in the end, well, that's uh, rather impractical, and uh, so we, we 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 don't know what is exactly happening. Uh, one one uh, aspect uh, is clear from this one because uh, transverse rotation obviously takes place within within the residuum, and the fact that the fact that the socket is now rotate, uh, allowed to rotate in the transverse plane during stands, that itself should be helpful. I suppose that is why uh, the pressures turned out the, uh, the, the way they were. To, to turn that question around as well, and I wondered if there's, a, if there's a link between the two presentations in terms of the type of foot, uh, rather than uh, rotational adapters, uh, do you think that the, the, the amount of rotation that you need in translation that you need, which looks obvious from your uh, diagrams that that's, that's you know, beneficial to the person. Could that be provided by a particular type of, of foot? Or are we in yeah. a, a different sort of uh, region of, of the amount of translation and rotation uh, allowed? Is that well, yeah, I mean, I mean, for a start, I would have hoped that there's a link between our two presentations as well. It's why we designed them that way. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, I suppose if you if you look at uh, uh, Hansen's type of uh, uh, rollover shape, I suppose uh, any any sort of compliance can be uh, generated within the foot itself. You wouldn't actually have to have the motion adapter itself. And as I mentioned before, I mean, some prosthetic feet they do allow some transverse rotation, although the magnitude is normally smaller than what you find at the motion adapter. And the um, uh, the longitudinal translation, I suppose, if you uh, just make the, the the foot far more compliant. That would uh, that, that would allow for that type of motion as well, and um, but but most feet are generally stiffer and don't allow that uh, that amount of motion. And I mean, some people don't actually like a motion adapter because it's additional weight. Although interestingly, um, something I didn't present here, but uh, um, but this study also involved a questionnaire, and uh, all of the participants uh, their, their their favorite setup was when uh, both motions were allowed simultaneously. You know, they, they were just saying it, it just felt um, a lot softer and more comfortable. So, yeah. Yeah, you, you both got me thinking about the prescription criteria and why we're actually prescribing different types of things. Yeah. And it may not be for the reasons why we initially think. Well, part of the reason I was asking is because at ISPO I saw a talk uh, by Stephen Gard and his colleagues and they were showing that the compliance in the residuum 
was just basically completely overriding anything he did with shock absorbing pylons. Mm. So they were saying that almost the prosthetic doesn't matter. The shock absorption in the prosthetic doesn't matter because there's so much going on in the residual socket interface. And so I was just wondering, like in terms of rotational and translation yeah. motions, if you had that handle. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know about that. But I mean, in terms of prescription, it's quite interesting because I remember in clinic, I've seen one guy here, uh, the consultant prescribed him with a uh, with a motion adapter uh, because that was supposed to be helpful for his uh, cycling. And I thought, well, that's completely the wrong thing because now you're trying to push the pedal downwards. And at the same time, you have to compress the motion adapter as well. So, you know, it, it, some, some prescriptions are not particularly uh, science based, and that obviously went a bit pear shaped. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Lovely, thank you.